between 23. And I have had a hard time finding this survey. There are very few copies of the original survey available. And I found one in Moscow, the old Lenin Library, the original Russian. The Azeris have reprinted it in 2003, and they have removed once again much of the Armenian material. So I spent about six months translating this and with the commentary. And it's amazing that it proves that in the mountainous areas, there were 300 villages there, about half and half. Half were Tatar. There is no word as Azeri since it didn't exist. Half are Tatar villages and half of Armenian villages. The majority of the Armenian villages are in the five mahals, the districts, which today compose Lernayin Karabakh or Artsakh. And 96.3% of the population of that five mahals, which is the Nagorno-Karabakh, in 1822 was Armenian. Only 3.6% were Muslim or Tatar. What leads scholars like you to a survey of the Russians of 1823? How does one even get a hint? How does one excavate, mine, unearth such a survey? Well, it was very difficult. We knew a survey existed. There were a few surveys done by the Russians. Uh, one was in the district of Shaki, one was in the district of Shirvan, one was in Karabakh, one was in Yerevan, one was in Nakhchivan. The Yerevan Nakhchivan were done after 1828. Mm -hmm. But these three, since Russia had occupied them before 1820, 1828, from 1820 to 1822, Russians conducted service mainly to see what taxes were collected. Mm -hmm. It wasn't at all to prove that the Armenians were there or the Muslims were there. Russians were totally neutral in this. The Russian government wanted to know what was the income from these provinces, because now they belong to Russia. And the whole survey, most of the survey, has to do with the taxes. All the villages, how much they paid, etc., etc. But what they have done is, they indicate which village was Armenian, mm -hmm. which village was Tatar, and which areas were nomadic pastures. So out of 650 names, 160 are Armenian villages, 140 are Tatar villages, and 350 are nomadic pastures. You know, you mentioned a Russian scholar, Ilya Pavlovich Petrushka. Uh, who was he and what was the significance of his works? He was a counselor, a government counselor, a government official, mm -hmm. who was appointed by General Yermolov, who was the commander-in-chief and the governor-in-chief of all of Transcaucasia, to conduct a survey mainly to find out what income can Russia derive from this new province. Mm -hmm. He, together with a cousin of Yermolov, a distant cousin, Colonel Yermolov II, went there and spent four months interviewing Muslims, Armenians, the secretary of the last Khan, the mm -hmm. bookkeeper of the last Khan who had the daftar, mm -hmm. the booklets, and they, tra they put it in Russian one by one, and it's about 380 pages, printed in later on, finally printed in 1860s. I think today maybe six copies exist in the world, two in Baku, one in Yerevan, one in Tiflis, one in Moscow, and one in Petersburg. You just uh, mentioned uh, three, four, five, ten words in uh, Iranian or Persian, of course, and or Arabic. And I remember in my family, we always have the saying, Hin daftar neremi panar. Don't go into the Google and uh, don't uh, uh, remind me of the, uh, some bad daftar, some pages. But uh, what languages does one have to uh, command in order to do the research which you have done? This one, you mainly need Russian. But you also need not very modern Russian, but early 19th century orthography Russian, because they were writing differently. The orthography was different, just like Armenian orthography mm -hmm. changed. Russian orthography also changed after the Russian Revolution. You also need Persian, Persian. and some Turkish. Mm -hmm. Somewhat, not the modern Turkish, but what they call today Azeri Turkish, which is Turco-Iranian local dialect. And which languages do you have full command of which have helped you with your research over the years? 
well, the Russian and of course the Iranian. There is some Armenian words, not much, and a very little knowledge of this, uh, the so-called New Azeri. I mean, I can understand it because there are so many Persian words in it. And so I have been able to translate because most of the taxes here, and there are 32 different taxes, most of the taxes are in Persian, although mm -hmm. it's written in Russian. Russian transliteration. They asked the local village, what is this tax? They told him, they wrote it in Russian. That was the most difficult part of working on this book, is to deciphering those Russian words to find out what the original was, because the Russian word does not, ex there's no such word in Russian. What is the significance of these excavated surveys? Well, there are two, well for the Armenians, the argument is, basically to challenge the Azeris, because it's even on the Azerbaijani embassy website today. If you go on the Azerbaijani website, they say Armenians arrived there after 1828, which is very, I mean, it's really childish. Uh, the issue of Karabakh should be resolved, as I said in this book. It will ultimately be resolved by politicians, by compromise, by the big powers getting involved. It cannot be resolved by falsifying <laughs> records. So it was the main reason for this, my main reason, was to prove that the Armenians were there. But that wasn't the only reason. The other reason is I am interested in the Iranian Khanates before the Russian takeover. Because the economy of the Iranian Khanates, the taxes that they paid, the social history of the region, the administrative history of the region is very important for Iranian historians of the period, not just Armenians, but Iranian. Because the main problem today we have, and I just was, I just got another book, Azerbaijani scholars, even if you put Karabakh aside, they're now claiming that even Yerevan was part of Azerbaijan. I just got a new book where they're using my book, my first book, the Khanate of Yerevan. They have taken three of my maps, and they have quoted me correctly, mm -hmm that according to Dr. Bernokian, Armenians were a minority in Yerevan in 1828. It's true that Armenians came from Iran and from Turkey after 1828. Fine. But what they completely ignore is the fact that these Armenians were the Armenians who were exiled by Shah Abbas 200 years before, when Shah Abbas took 250,000 Armenians to Iran right across the border. So 200 years later, the same Armenians, all they had to do is to cross the border and come back to where they had been exiled from. So that they don't talk about at all. And they say Armenians came there after 1828, but not Karabakh. Karabakh Armenians were always there. It had nothing to do with this part. And obviously you're holding the book, and I have the book, and uh, it's uh, really different when you read the book, you read the pages, and, and there's a lot of admiration and uh, uh, thankfulness for your research. Uh, my question is being about thankfulness. What kind of support does uh, as an Armenian scholar get from the community? What are the what is an important support, and what organizations have helped you in the uh, in the, your mission? Well, that's a very prevalent question. Uh, my translation was done free. My work was done free. Unlike the Azeris, whose government is really helping them, and recently they published a three-volume unbelievable work in London selling for $275 in a, lead, in a slip case called The Armenian Question in the Caucasus. That's printed the name in, of the book. That was serious. name of the book. The Armenian Question in, in the Caucasus. Caucasus. And it was printed by the Azerbaijani Society, uh, Azerbaijani European Society, three beautifully produced hardcover volumes in a slip case. And with all the Russian documents, of course, they select the documents, mm -hmm. yeah, of course. but with the, with the introduction in English. Mm -hmm. All the introduction is in English. Mm -hmm. The documents are only Russian, so since nobody, most people are going to read the three volumes, they're going to read the introduction, and the introduction puts the Azeri pressure, and it's sponsored by the government, $275. They get, and for all their books, even the book that I just mentioned that I got from University of Michigan about, about the Khanate of Yerevan, which they are claiming that, uh, Yerevan was Azerbaijan, everything was Azerbaijan. Armenians at all have no reason to be anywhere in the Caucasus mm -hmm. at all. They mm -hmm. came later. And very beautifully produced book. So they got, with the introduction by Aliyev, the, the new Aliyev, mm -hmm. president of Azerbaijan, and dedicated to his, the memory of his father. Mm -hmm. Beautifully produced book. I 
had a very hard time. Fortunately, I got three people, Artemis Nazarian, mm -hmm. Nasser, and my Armenian friends in Toronto, which, which basically gathered some money to print this book. The printing of this book cost only $7,000 for a thousand copies. Okay, my work was totally free. All my work, and I had a very hard time. And I'm not just complaining about yes. this. I'm lucky that I've been able to publish this as my 20th book. But many young Armenian scholars are suffering. For some reason, I'm hoping this audience and you and others should realize that they have to start supporting some work for Armenian writers. It could, and not just historians, any Armenian artist, dancer, musician, writer, more and more. There are some of us who are very good, like Peter Balakian, who is wonderful. He doesn't need as much support, but there are others who are not as famous and who may, and I'm not talking about myself, <laughs> but younger people who should be supported. I hope we will wake up because the Aziris are getting unbelievable support. And as Florence Savakian just mentioned, the money they are spending for the UN and everything is unbelievable. Yes, they have more resources, but the Armenian diaspora is not poor. It's not poor. Let me just go back to the book you mentioned that was recently published by Azeri scholars, and you said most of the documents are in Russian, and uh, many people would read only the English. But what is the position of the scholars? Let us talk about the scholars. What is their comment? What is their reaction, their response to these writings? Well, the problem is the book, this three-volume book, was not written by scholars. This three-volume book was put together by five Azeri, Azeri businessmen who are oh, in but, London. But what, are, what is the response of scholars to these books? So far, it has, I'm the only one who has reviewed it. It just came out last okay. month. I reviewed it in Ararat magazine on, okay. on the web. As okay. you know, Ararat is only coming oh, yes, on the web yes. now. And it's in the recent, if anybody is Asia, interested, yeah. they can look at it. But I, of course, I could not review it in depth because Ararat magazine doesn't have that format. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's in, in depth enough. But it's unbelievable when you look at it. It's just you will be surprised of the quality of the work they have done. I mean, in publishing it, not the quality of the scholarly work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It and looks I, fantastic. I know you will be going on a book tour. Tell us uh, where, when, and if you are in the area. They will be, this book will be presented at AGBU, I think, November 17th in New York. Montreal, uh, Thursday, this Thursday, mm -hmm. November 3rd. Toronto, November 4th. Detroit, December 2nd. And Cleveland, sometime in February. And there are plans to go to... Uh, oh, I did it already. I presented it in California in the Artsakh Conference in Glendale two weeks ago and in the Ararat Eskijan Museum two weeks ago. But I'll be going back to California, to Silicon Valley, Berkeley, and other places as AGBU starts working. AGBU has taken it upon themselves, which was very nice of them, to push, to basically publicize this book, because hoping that people, will, even if they don't read it themselves, it's not an easy book mm -hmm, to read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the introduction, the commentary are easily, but the rest is basically the survey of 600 villages. But to send it to representatives, send it to diplomats, send it to local libraries, sending to UN, etc. The Gharabagh representative is very happy with it. He, ha he was there. I sent him a copy. And let's see what will happen. You just mentioned the, the introduction uh, and uh, the first few pages you had uh, mentioned that you dedicate the book to your uh, teachers and classmates in Iran in the 50s or 60s. Why did you do that? Well, when you have, <laughs> again, it sounds like boasting, <laughs> but when you have 20 books, you basically <laughs> have dedicated it. I mean, my parents, <laughs> my sister, my brother, my That's children. Rafi, Vicky Hovanesian, uh, my professor Richard Hovanesian. I mean, there is very little <laughs> left. But also, this was something important because this had to do uh, with the education I got in Iran. Because without Iranian, the knowledge of Iranian, this wouldn't have worked. So it was a kind of a thank you to the people who really taught me the intricacies of the Iranian language. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Is there anything in closing you would like to mention? In closing is, I'm very pleased that you have invited me, and uh, it's very important that Armenian scholars, writers, etc., get a forum. And it's very important that Armenian Radio Hour 
gives us time to send this message to others so people will be able to know that such a book exists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Dr. Bornuchian. And uh, once again, uh, for uh, those of you who would like to purchase the book, it's entitled, it's a beautiful covered book, a very, very beautiful design. The 18... Uh, 23 Russian survey of the Karabakh province, a primary source on the demography and economy of Karabakh in the early 19th century by our guest, Dr. George Bonutian. Um, how much does it cost? $45. $45. And uh, this, we do encourage you to uh, purchase the book and uh, support, support uh, uh, Armenian scholars, support... Uh, uh, history, support uh, Armenian rights, support uh, the liberation of Karabakh, support uh, the legality which we have to face in the, the international courts as we fight for justice. And also, if you would like to buy more than one book, maybe donate it to a local library and or an embassy, or uh, you can think of friends also, but it is a very, very interesting book and a uh, very important one, a very unique book, if I may add so. You're listening to the Armenian Radio out of New Jersey on 89.5 FM, the radio station of Seton Hall University. Very, very soon we'll be moving to Tempcare and Tempcare by uh, Broadway.